Hello everyone, welcome to part two, of part th of three, where we're going to be looking at cellular respiration. So today, we last time we talked about glucose oxidation release, and we'll continue a little bit with that, but we'll also look at the anaerobic pathway. So remember, anaerobic means no oxygen is used. So how does glucose oxidation release energy? So remember, we have different metabolic pathways. We have catabolic and, and anabolic. And these metabolic pathways, so catabolic harvests energy and carbohydrates ATP. And again, pathways used depend on the presence of O2. So as we talked about, there are several different aerobic pathways. So first we have glycolysis, and then we can have the formation of pruve, and then either aerobic or anaerobic. So again, anaerobic is the lack of oxygen, and this ends up in fermentation with complete oxi incomplete oxidation and CO2 and organic compounds as waste products, and only two ATP are produced. So first we'll talk about glycolysis briefly. So glycolysis is essentially the splitting of a sugar. So, so one thing to remember, a glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of all cells. Glycolysis is common to both anaerobic and aerobic pathways. So again, as we move down that chain, we have like glycolysis. Then after glycolysis, then we have the decision of aerobic or anaerobic. So all cells go through this. Glycolysis provides the starting materials for the fermentation reaction in anaerobic pathways and then cellular respiration in aerobic pathways. So here we can look at the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So prokaryotes, so listed as a bacteria, they use in the cytoplasm, they have glycolysis, fermentation in the citric acid cycle. And then on the plasma membrane, they have plasma per, uh, perivate oxidation and electron transfer chain. So they still have similar mechanisms as we do, they're just in different places. They also don't have mitochondria compared to us. So eukaryotes are external to the mitochondria, and usually in cytoplasm is glycolysis and fermentation. Inside the mitochondria, we have in the inner membrane, we have the electron transport chain. In the mitochondrial matrix, we have the citrate acid cycle, or CAC, and pyruvate oxidation. Also, this is called the Krebs cycle, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Glycolysis releases energy by oxidizing glucose to pyruvate essentially the final product of glycolysis. So again, it's the splitting of the sugars. It begins breakdown of glucose with parcel oxidation. Glycolysis is a pathway of 10 enzyme-catalyzed reactions. We'll look at this in much more detail in our biochemistry lectures. So in glycolysis, the first five reactions are endergonic, so it means energy-consuming. So we need to invest some energy in glycolysis, so it's not just a positive pathway and the last five reactions are exergonic this is where we produce our energy so there's usually there's a net gain in glycolysis but we still have to invest atp in so the reactants of glycolysis are a glucose molecule so one that has so one has six carbons we need atp so we need two atp added initially so that's our investment up front we also need adp phosphate and nad plus so remember that's that carrier and then these will form to help form ATP. So this is a big overview picture of glycolysis. So we won't go into too much detail as this is kind of will be saved for biochemistry. But even here we can see this is a we got a citric acid cycle here as well. So we'll just go through quickly. So we have glucose. Here in our reaction one, we have our first ATP consuming reaction. I'll just focus on the bigger steps for now. So step three, we have our second ATP consuming reaction, so that's two. Step four, we have the cleavage of the six carbon sugar to two three carbon molecules. So this is when our pathway splits. So in glycolysis, we have basically two pathways activating at the same time. So each glycolysis nets two pruvates. But you have to be careful when you read some textbooks because they'll just look at one pathway at once, but it's actually happening twice. So in step six, we have NADPH producing reaction, seven, first ATP producing reaction, and then 10, second ATP producing reaction. So an easy thing to, uh, one important thing to remember is the three phases of glycolysis. So there's phase one, which is the preparatory phase. So phase one, the preparatory phase with the consumption of two ATP. So we're prepping. So phase two is where we have the cleavage phase. So as we talked about, we have the cleavage of the six carbon, 
sugar, so our fructose 1, 6 biphosphate is split into glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate and di dihydroxyacetone phosphate, so that's the split. Then these are split into two glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphates. Phase 3, which is the payoff phase, this is where we have the production of 4 ATP and 2 NADH, which again, those NADHs are recycled or used in other pathways, but we'll talk about that later. So, we need substrate level phosphorylation for ATP synthesis. So, ATP synthesis is an enzyme catalyzed transfer of phosphate groups from substrate to ADP for ATP synthesis. So, again, we talked about we need ADP plus the inorganic phosphate to ATP. And these are involved in reaction 7 and 10 of glycolysis. So, if you look back, those are both the energy producing reactions. So we have an enzyme called a kinase, which is kinases are usually involved in phosphorylations. So here we have another enzyme kinase. So this inorganic phosphate is added to substrates from ATP hydrolysis in endergonic reactions. So remember, endergonic energy is added or is consumed. Sorry. Then this inorganic phosphate is transferred from substrates with high energy bonds to ADP, forming ATP. So again, we need to use energy to make the ATP, ADP to ATP. So glycolysis involves five endergonic reactions. So again, this means it uses ATP or uses energy. So it uses energy. So this is where you have a transfer of energy from two ATP through the ATP hydrolysis. We use two ATP slash glu per, glu per glucose molecule. So here we can see reactions one to five are energy investing reactions. So remember we had that phase one, our preparatory phase, while reactions four to five, which was the cleavage phase, the enzyme aldolase splits. So that's the, that's an al relatively important enzyme to remember. Splits the six carbon molecule into two, three carbon molecules of G3P, which is essentially the short form of glycerol aldehyde three phosphate. Then, and as we said, reactions one to three, phosphate from ATP is added to carbon six and carbon one of the glucose to form one six, fructose one six biphosphate. So these one six indicate the carbon location and where the phosphates are added. As you can see here, added to carbon six and carbon one, and that's where this name comes from. So glycolysis also has five exergonic reactions where we release ATP. So these are the energy harvesting reactions. So energy is transferred from glucose to the energy carrier NAD plus in ATP. So here's steps five to eight. So in reaction six, two NADH and hydrogen ion molecules are produced by a redox reaction. So here we can see two phosphates in NAD go in, two NADH come out. In reaction 7, two ATP are generated by substrate-level phosphorylation. So remember, we talked about the kinases. These are involved in phosphorylation. So this one's as specifically named phosphoglycerate kinase. We can see here it's because it's dealing with phosphoglycerate. And we see here this 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PG. And again, we don't need to memorize these enzymes right now, but we'll talk about them in biochemistry. So again, reaction 6... 7 and 10 are energy harvesting reactions. That's the key point here. So in steps 9 and 10, energy from glucose is transferred to ADP. So again, reaction 10. Again, we have another kinase because we're doing phosphorylation. And this one's called pyruvate kinase, which is very important. Two ATP are generated by substrate level phosphorylation again. Again, the final product is pyruvate. And it, remember, it's two pyruvate per glucose. So we have the glucose path to go down, and then it splits. So remember, we get two pyruvates. Two pyruvates per glucose. So I'm just running it down just so you guys can hear it again. So here's another one that's called PEP, just so we can, if you see it again. <coughs> 
And again, pyruvate is three carbon. We go from that six carbon here, and then we have two, three carbon pyruvates. Those carbons are important in the sense that when we move into the other steps of oxidation, we follow the carbons. So again, glycolysis is the splitting of the sugar. It begins breakdown of glucose through oxidation. It's a pathway of 10 enzyme catalyzed reactions, as we talked about. So as we saw, there's five reactions which are endergonic, where we invest that ATP, energy consuming. And the last five reactions are extragonic, where we have the energy release. So again, we have the reactants, glucose, so one has six carbons, two ATP, and we need ADP, PI, and NAD+. So the products, as we discussed, are two pyruvate molecules with three carbons, ATP, so a total of four are produced, and we have our NADH and hydrogen ion. So an energy in glycolysis is a net gain. So remember, we invest two and get two. So we get two new ATP per glucose molecule. So again, that was similar to, it's not the greatest gain. But as we'll see with cellular respiration, we get much more benefit. So as we said, glycolysis reactions are coupled to extragonic ATP hydrolysis overcome the activation barrier. So here we can see change in free energy, or change in G. So here's that we slowly build up, investing in our ATP. Then we get to the activation barrier. Boom, we drop down. And now we're getting energy. becoming much more extragonic. So each glucose yields two pyruvate, two ATP, two NADBH, and two hydrogen. So again, let's write that down. Two pyruvates, two ATP. This is net gain. So net, two NADH, plus two hydrogen ions, which are, coming, which are very important. So again, steps one to five, or endergonic, and steps 6 to 10 are extragonic reactions with ATP form through substrate-level phosphorylation using kinases at steps 7 and 10, which produced ATP. Again, this is when we have the split to G3P, and then we have this phosph inorganic phosphate from ATP. So pyruvate from glycolysis is the key decision point in catabolism. So here we have our glucose going through glycolysis in the cytoplasm. So now we have that pyruvate. So again, we can go through anaerobic or aerobic. So if there's no oxygen, we can have fermentation. So in fermentation, we turn it into ethanol or lactate. Whereas in if we have O2, we have we change pyruvate into acetyl CoA, which we'll talk about later. So here, just so you know, for landmarking, here's our outer mitochondrial membrane, and here's our mitochondria. Then this acetyl-CoA will enter the citric acid cycle, and then this will, at the end of this, we'll deal with the electron transport chain. But as you can see here, there's many more pathways, and again, we can get up to 32 ATP using cellular respiration, which involves O2. So what happens when there's no oxygen available? We have fermentation. So here's just a simple figure, glycolysis. We get our glucose, turns to pyruvate, enters fermentation, so O2 is absent. Then we have lactate or alcohol or ethanol. So fermentation permits production of ATP in the absence of oxygen. So it involves recycling using the redox reactions. So essentially, as we talked about, it regenerates energy, regenerates the energy carrier NAD plus used for glycolysis. So reactions anaerobically oxidize the NADH we produce from glycolysis to NAD+, for reuse, as I mentioned earlier, in subsequent glycolysis while using while producing pyruvate to lactate and ethanol. So essentially it changes that NADH back into NAD, so it can go back into glycolysis, while it also changes pyruvate into lactate or alcohol. So fermentation is used by all by organisms and cells in the absence of O2, as we mentioned. It derives energy from glycolysis and fermentation through partial oxidation. So that's why it's considered partial oxidation of glucose. And it occurs in the cytoplasm of O2-deprived cells. So again, we went over here. 
You can see fermentation and fermentation. Fermentation recycles the reactants to allow ATP production to continue in glycolysis without O2. So again, again, there's no energy produced with fermentation. So that's why it was 2 ATP when we discussed it, because you're essentially just getting what you got from glycolysis. So all it's doing is essentially a way to recycle that NADH to kindly repeat glycolysis over and over again. So again, fermentation is recycling using redox reactions, regenerates the carrier NAD plus for glycolysis. The reactions anaerobically oxidize NADH and hydrogen ions from glycolysis and NAD plus for reuse in subsequent glycolysis while reducing pyruvate to lactate ethanol. So again, here we'll have the equations kind of in the reactants. So reactants again from glycolysis are two, three carbon pyruvates. And then we have our NADH and hydrogen ion from glycolysis. So there's two kinds of fermentations. There's a lactic acid and alcoholic. So lactic acid fermentation occurs in muscles depleted of oxygen. So you've probably definitely heard of lactic acid build up in the muscles. So a lot of people talk about how this is and you know on that burning in your muscles, but a lot of research says more about the hydrogen ions than the actual lactic acid itself, but that's for a different topic. But yeah, you've definitely heard of like, oh, I got lactic acid buildup in my muscles. That's kind of like the same premise here. And there's also lactic acid in bacteria. In bacteria. So again, we have our glucose, which produces our 2 ATP. 2 ATP. We also got our 2 NADH. Then we had our 2 pyruvates. So these go through our redox reactions. So we can see here that this NADH that we produce from glucose gets turned back into 2 NAD+. And which goes back into glycolysis, so we get that circle I was talking about. And here a fermentation reaction occurs where we form 2 lactate. So we can see here, just so you know, we can see the differences, but we'll get to it later. So in alcoholic fermentation, which is used in wine and beer making, and used in bread making, we have the same process here. So now when we get to pyruvate, we actually lose two carbons. And we also see we can which turns it into two acetyl aldehyde. So this loss of carbons changes the structure into a different molecule, and this acetaldehyde will then, again, help transfer NADPH, NADH sorry, back to NAD, and this will become a fermentation reaction and becoming 2-ethanol. Again, another redox reaction. So again, the products, which are, can be tooth pathways, either lactic acid or alcoholic. So with lactic acid fermentation, we produce lactate, which is a three-carbon molecule, NAD+, which goes back to glycolysis. In alcoholic fermentation, we produce ethanol, which is two carbons. So remember, we lost the carbon. Some carbon is removed. So we have our carbon, and then we have NAD+. And again, no energy is consumed or released. We just get to get the go back into glycolysis and get the two ATP from glycolysis over and over again. So here's a good summary figure. Whoops, sorry. So here's our overview of the respiratory pathways under anaerobic conditions. So as we see, anaerobic is much more simple compared to aerobic, at least from a studying standpoint. But in summary, fermentation recycles the energy carrier NAD plus for glycolysis. That's just, that's the pretty much the most important point. So again, here's our initial reactants. We had our glucose. We need that ADP and NAD plus. Go through glycolysis. We get those two pyruvates. Then if we don't have oxygen, we enter this fermentation reaction where we need pyruvate and NADH from glycolysis. Again, then we form alcohol or lactate. Then these final products are at ATP, at least from glycolysis. And then the final products from glucose, from glycolysis, sorry, ATP, NADPH, NADH, and pyruvate. So which you can see over here, which are the which we need. And then the production. The final products from fermentation are NAD+, which goes back, we can see here, it goes back into glycolysis, and then we either have lactate or acid or alcohol, and then if we have alcoholic fermentation, we also produce some CO2. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that. This is the end of part two, so I'll see you in part three. And yeah, see ya.